Hey guys, welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and escape the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. Today we're going to talk about tesofensine a little bit, and I've gotten a few questions uh, about this particular drug from you guys, and when I did a quick search on YouTube, there are all kinds of videos from uh, a number of different sources talking about this this drug, which is being touted as like the next big weight loss drug. It's... um. It's been drowned out a little bit by the GLP-1 agonist for obvious reasons, um, but it is uh, it's it is definitely gaining popularity, and I think we need to talk about it a little bit because uh, I noticed that a lot of the videos um, they they didn't really dive into how this particular drug works, and um, I think they kind of approach it from a bit of a superficial angle, or you know in some cases it was from sources that might be uh, might actually be selling it, and so. You know they're not always as unbiased as they should be so i uh i do not sell this i do not prescribe it um so i'm really hoping to give you guys a bit of an unbiased review about this um you know in short there's it, i have some concerns about this particular drug it uh it certainly sounds very promising um with in terms of the early data certainly the anecdotal stuff that's out there sounds very impressive but um you know i i try not to be swayed by anecdotal stuff i i like studies this is an evidence-based channel so um so we're going to try to stick to that a little bit okay so what the heck is tesofensine so tesofensine it's it's been around for a while um, it's what's called a triple monoamine reuptake inhibitor, okay? Now, monoamines are a class of uh, molecules uh, that are neurotransmitters, most of them. Uh, so we're talking about serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine. I think epinephrine is technically a monoamine, but we're not going to talk about that. Tesofensine works on all three of these neurotransmitters to inhibit the reuptake in the um, synaptic cleft. And I'm, I'm going to show you some detailed uh, diagrams, and we'll talk about that mechanism a little bit because I think it's it's important to understand that so that you know exactly how this particular drug works. And then once you once you understand that, you can see where some of the potential dangers with this medication could lie and some of the potential side effects that um, we're starting to see with this stuff. So um, it came up, I think it was a Dutch company uh, called Neurosearch uh, was, I think, the first ones that developed it. And they, they were looking for drugs to treat Parkinson's disease um, and, and Alzheimer's as well. And it was a big flop for that. It really didn't work very well, but they did notice, uh, and it was one of the things that they categorized as an adverse effect, is that a lot of the test subjects stopped eating and lost a tremendous amount of weight, which isn't always the best thing for an elderly person with advanced Parkinson's and dementia. A lot of them are already suffering from sarcopenia, so probably a bad idea to give them tesofensine, but it's been picked up you know, by, um, by one or more other companies and is going through trials currently um, as a weight loss drug trying to get uh, approval. So this is just a little schematic diagram of the monoamines, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. Uh, it's probably overly simplistic to say that uh, how critical these are for, for you as a functioning human being. Um, they are critical in uh, cellular communication within the central nervous system. They control uh, almost everything related to cognition, your mood, your level of alertness, um, your preferences, your cravings, uh, your ability to uh, enjoy pleasure. Uh, they're, they're involved in depression and sadness and uh, a whole host of uh, neuropsychiatric diseases. Like they are critically, critically important. So you, you, have, to be, you have to respect drugs that manipulate these, these particular substances because they they can have some very profound and sometimes unexpected effects and they should not be taken lightly okay here's a diagram just giving you a bird's eye view of how this particular drug and really a lot of other drugs ssris and uh, snris uh, antidepressants how how they exert their effects so um <clears throat> At the top here, we have our presynaptic neurons. Uh, in this particular case, there there's three of them. So we have a serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine uh, presynaptic neurons. And then there's a postsynaptic neuron. So this is how, for you guys that um, are not aware, th this is how neurons, um, how signals are sent throughout your brain from, from one cell 
uh, from one neuron to the other, right? So they have these little dendrites that go out, and they don't actually touch each other. There's a, there's a microscopic little space in between the two. So in order for a signal to get from, from one to the other, in order to transmit information, it has to be set... Uh, that's to be translated into a chemical signal, which is one of these neurotransmitters, which is ejected out the, uh, at the end of this presynaptic neuron. It floats across the tiny little space, and it's picked up by the postsynaptic neuron, and then it triggers an action potential, and off it goes. And, you know, all of this happens in milliseconds. It's obviously incredibly fast. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do all the things that we do in terms of, you know, thinking and, and moving quickly and, um that sort of thing. So let's, um, I guess we can just pick one here. We'll pick the serotonin one. So um, serotonin is, is created in the cell and, and then it's packaged into these little vesicles, which are in a, uh, they're contained in a, uh, uh, a little bilayer, essentially lipid bilayer vesicle. And they, they float down to the, um, you know, the end of this presynaptic neuron. And when the time comes, when the signal is given, it will merge with the lipid bilayer here and it will discharge its cargo out into the presynaptic space. That's these little yellow dots. So you can imagine here, it's the same thing with dopamine, same thing with norepinephrine. norepinephrine. It, it diffuses across this space and then it's picked up by a, the appropriate receptor on the other side. So you can see here, there's a 5-HT receptor, that's serotonin, D1, D2, that's dopamine, and then we have the norepinephrine receptor here. And um, they are picked up by that receptor and then that chemical signal is translated into an electrical signal uh, generating an action potential which takes off and then this process will be repeated thousands or perhaps millions of times uh, and uh, off, you know, off it goes. So it's, uh, it's very elegant, very, very simple, but, but very elegant and very effective. So there's a number of different ways to manipulate this process. And there are all sorts of drugs that do this. Um, you know, all of the antidepressants work in this system in one way or the other. So if we want to increase the intensity of this signal here, you know, for example, if we want to increase the concentration of the serotonin or prolong the amount of serotonin uh, or prolong the amount of time that serotonin spends in this uh, space here between these two neurons, well, we can, we can do a number of things. We can, one, we can block its reuptake. So you can see here uh, in the presynaptic neuron, there's these little... Um, little protein channels that are at the, at the tip. And there's the CERT, the DAT, and the NET, okay? And those are the mono, uh, monoamine uh, reuptake channels or proteins. So they suck this stuff back up and then they put it back where it originally came from, back inside the cell here in a vesicle. And then, um, you know, it may stay there or a lot of times it's broken down by something called monoamine oxidase. Now, uh, a lot of people have, they confuse uh, tesofensine, which is a reuptake inhibitor with uh, MAOI inhibitors. So, uh, or monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So th these are kind of old school drugs. They do not get used very much anymore. They were originally used for a number of different things, including depression, and they still get used a little bit for Parkinson's. They are, um, they're, they're potentially dangerous drugs. They have a lot of drug-drug interactions. They, um, they're not terribly effective, uh, and they just don't get prescribed very much anymore. So um, we don't really see those very much, but, but that's not how tesofensine works. So it's not an MAOI, um, for those of you guys that may be confused on that. And I, and I was originally when I first looked at this. So what, what tesofensine does is it blocks the re these little reuptake channels. And what's you know, relatively unique about it is that it blocks all three of them. Um, there's not very many drugs that do that. So it's a triple, like a triple inhibitor. Um, you know, SSRIs will block, one, you know, the serotonin one, and then you'll have, uh, you know, SNRIs that can block like the norepinephrine and the serotonin. So you get like two, maybe two out of the three are blocked, but um, it, it's, it's not common to have drugs that block all three, um, but tesofensine is actually one of them. And there is one other one that I'll mention briefly that, um, that was around in the 1960s, but had some serious side effects, so it was uh, it was discontinued. Okay, this is just just one more little little diagram here. 
showing that uh, MAT protein. And again, there's a CERT, S-E-R-T, NET, N-E-T, and dopamine transporter, which is D-A-T. So you have um, the substrate here, this, this little yellow-orange little oval here. Again, we can just pretend that that's We'll say it's dopamine this time. So it actually, it requires sodium, which is usually there's no shortage of sodium. But you can imagine that uh, in, you know, situations of like hyponatremia, this might be an issue. But sodium is required uh, in order for this little transporter to work. So the substrate uh, is out here in the extracellular space. It comes down into this binding area, this little pocket. Uh, and then as long as there's sodium there, it induces a conformational change. So it's open, it takes a hold of the substrate, it closes, so you can see it's encased, you know, briefly within, um, within the protein channel itself, and then it undergoes another conformational change and opens up on the bottom side, and out it goes, it pops out into the intracellular space. So kind of a, kind of a cool little, little diagram that, uh, that shows how that thing works. And again, tesofensine messes with this, with, with this channel. So, you know, as I mentioned, there's a ton of drugs, and this is like not even close to a, comp a comprehensive list, ton of drugs that influence these uh, these transporters. So I'm not gonna go through this whole diagram here because it's, it's super busy, but at the top here of the transporters, you have DAT, NET, and CERT, and we can look down here, we'll go down to inhibitors. So cocaine is a very potent inhibitor of of dat dopamine uh, it actually also inhibits norepinephrine and uh, serotonin also to a certain extent you can see that there as well bupropion uh, otherwise known as well butrins commonly used um, uh, very commonly used antidepressant uh, works on the dat uh, transporter as well methylphenidate otherwise known as ritalin uh, works on dat and net so um, not so much on, on serotonin. And then, uh, you know, we can go over to the other side here. Um, the nor net is, you know, it's for norepinephrine, but it actually picks up dopamine a little bit too. So, um, so these are the drugs, you know, just a few of them here. Uh, amphetamines, uh, MDMA, otherwise known as ecstasy, does it. Uh, there's, there's methylphenidate again, uh, Ritalin. And then we go over here to CERT, and this is where all your SSRIs and many of your tricyclic antidepressants like, and other things like trazodone uh, that affect um, the serotonin uh, transporter. So a lot of different ways to manipulate this, this system. And again, tesofensine is just one of them. But if you look down here, there's another little drug called nomofensine, and it's in the involving DAT and NET. Um, it also affects the CERT pathway as well. They just don't mention it here. Um, but um, that that's a cousin of tesofensine that, again, had some major issues, came out as an antidepressant, but was was discontinued. So um, one of the things that <laughs> that struck me when I when I when I saw how tesofensine worked, I was like, you know, that sounds a lot like cocaine, you know, and you can see it here because cocaine does the same thing. It, it affects all three of these um, these transport proteins. So I'm like, well, do, so do do people get high off tesofensine? And you know, the answer is no, they don't. Uh, it, it's not psychoactive in that way. Although it's kind of interesting. I came across a number of different videos, and maybe you guys that have some experience with this drug personally can can chime in on this, that um, many people feel more activated, more alert. They have a boost in their mood. Um, they feel more productive, um, maybe not to the extent that they would on something like Ritalin or Modafinil, but there does seem to be, you know, in some people like a, a bit of a stimulatory effect. So certainly like nothing along the lines of cocaine, but um, there there may be something there. I didn't. There really wasn't much of that even discussed in any of the actual studies. So it all it's all anecdotal. But if you again, if you guys have experience with that, chime in on the comments here because I would love to hear about that a little bit. So I don't know if it technically would be classified as a nootropic, but I think some people think it is. Uh, again, I don't have any personal experience with it, but uh, if you do, let me know. So yeah, it's um, it's definitely not not like cocaine, uh, as it talks about here in this in this article. It's like cocaine, but no fun. So what was I put this in here because this was kind of amusing. I thought, um, and uh, they it was a study about uh, that the company Neurosearch did, and they actually gave um, tesofensine to uh, a whole bunch of like 
very experienced recreational drug users, you know, men and women who uh, used a lot of cocaine in their day, among other drugs. And um, yeah, they, you know, the, the bottom line is the uh, the recreational drug users, they didn't like Tessa fencing. They didn't get anything out of it. They're like, I'm not taking this stuff. I'll go back to using cocaine and amphetamines. So anyway, interesting study. But the, you know, the idea that they put forth is like, you know, this stuff has, it has such a long half-life and, you know, the, one of the reasons that cocaine apparently is so euphoric is obviously it's like extremely potent in manipulating these, these neurotransmitters, but it comes on very quickly. So it's like this, you know, instant rush, apparently, of, uh, you know, of euphoria and energy and, you know, mood elevation, in addition to all the cardiovascular stuff, the tachycardia, the hypertension, et cetera, you know, that come along with it. But tesofensine is... Um, you know, as we'll talk about here shortly, is a extremely long half-life and it's kind of just slow effect. And so it's just not, it doesn't give that rush that um, cocaine does. And that's, they theorize that that's why it just, it really doesn't have much in the way of abuse potential um, because it's just not that fun to take tesofensine. So, um, so yeah, so the half-life, I mean, if, if you took a, a, a capsule of tesofensine right now, it would take five to eight hours for you to get uh, a peak level with that. But the interesting thing is the half-life is really, it's like a insanely long. It's like 220 hours. And that's because it has a metabolite that has, that has biological activity that's also, um, you know, that has an extremely long half-life. It's metabolized through the liver. We're going to talk about that at the end because uh, that, you know, that, that I have some concerns about that um, as well. But it's, um, yeah, super long half-life, 220 hours. So, you know, it raises the possibility. This is typically dosed daily. Like all of the studies show that it's dosed daily. But when I see a drug that has such a long half-life like that, certainly after you've reached a steady state, you've been on it for a while, um, it sort of makes the case that like maybe you could you could do intermittent dosing on this. Maybe you could dose this twice a week. Maybe you could dose it three times a week. Um, and as I'm going to talk about here in a second, I, there's potential to maybe just use this on an as needed basis. I don't, there's no studies on it, but, um, yeah, it makes me wonder, like, maybe you don't need to take this stuff every, just every single day when you have such a long half-life. Um, the other thing obviously is if you do take it every day and, you know, let's say you go on a trip and for a few days and you forget it, it's, it's not a big deal. You know, it's going to still be in your system and, um, you know, you're going to still receive the benefits, you know, from that. So, um, so where are we at with tesofensine, you know, in terms of its approval, it's, it is still not FDA approved. And I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, I, I'm a little bit surprised by that. I mean, they, they have, there's good studies on tesofensine going back, you know, 2005, 2006, um, that are all positive. And so I kind of wonder like, well, what is taking so long for this drug to get approved? And, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, maybe you guys do. Um, but this is one of the more recent things. It's from a, the company, uh, Sononia, who I think has picked it up now. Uh, they are also out of Denmark and they published a phase three clinical trial where they had some, you know, fairly positive effects. It was a 24 week trial. They had over, uh, it was like 372 obese individuals and, um, they lost a significant amount of body weight. Um, I think the highest dose, um, group lost up to like 10% of their body weight. So, uh, with, you know, a relatively benign side effect profile. So, so that's a phase three trial without going into too much detail. There's, uh, you know, zero, one, two, three, and then finally phase four. So you need to have, you need to complete a phase three trial that is acceptable, preferably more than one to the FDA in order to receive approval. And then once it's approved, you know, then it can be sold on the market. And that's where you can do like a phase four trial. So with each trial, you basically you have a larger and larger and larger group of people, um, you know, to, you know, and each one has a different goal. Like, you know, you want to establish safety. OK, I mean, you're not we're not killing people with this drug. So this this medication, tesofensine, past that. OK, um, you know, is it effective? OK, it seems to be effective, um, you know, how, and then, you know, is it non-inferior to um, you know, the currently available drugs, et cetera, seems to be, you know, right up there with, uh, some of the weaker GLP ones actually, when it comes to weight loss. Um, so we're still waiting on this and that's why, like, 
as a doctor, I can't, you know, write you a prescription and have you go down to Walmart for tesofensine. So right now, to the best of my knowledge, this is only available through these, quote, research chemical sites, which you guys know how I feel about those, buyer beware. Um, and I believe it can, be, uh, it can be obtained through compounding pharmacies, which is probably a safer route, um, uh, you know, with a, with a physician's prescription. But, you know, as of, as of right now, 2023, this is still not FDA approved. Again, if, if you, you guys know what the holdup is, let me know. Um, because this drug has been studied for years and years, and I have not seen any studies, at least any published data, showing you know really major adverse effects, um, anything that would torpedo this drug. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, I did a little research, you know, in terms of like I was wondering, well, how many drugs that have successful phase three trials actually make it to the market, and it's about twenty five to thirty percent. So. I mean, even even with this phase three study, it's still not uh, certainly not a guarantee at this point. But, you know, I guess I guess time will tell. OK, let's let's talk about, you know, how this drug works and some of the studies that are out there. So th this is a rat study, um, but it it's really good. It's it, it, it basically it this translates the, the, the effects that were seen in the study translate pretty well into humans, and it has some nifty graphs that I wanted to show you, which is why I chose it. So, so this particular article is from Neuropharmacology 2010. Again, this is an old study, right? It's 13 years ago this was done. Uh, it's called Tesafensine, a novel triple monoamine reuptake inhibitor induces appetite suppression by indirect stimulation of alpha-1 adrenoceptor and dopamine D1 receptor pathways in the diet-induced obese rat. I don't know where they come up with these names. That's a mouthful. But um, they um, they got these, you know, a whole colony of mice. They made them morbidly obese by feeding them a very high fat, high calorie diet. And then they exposed them to various levels, in some cases, extremely high levels of um, tesofensine. And, you know, we and then they looked at the effects and uh, they were pretty interesting, actually. Again, this was a fairly short, they, they looked at mainly short term uh, data with these with these mice, but they, you know, they did look at some longer term ones as well. But it's the short term ones I want to show you guys that are pretty interesting, because this is why I was saying like maybe this could be used on an as needed basis. Again, I take that with a grain of salt. What they concluded: tesofensine dose dependently induces hypophagia, so less eating. A single dose of tesofensine, so they use various doses: zero point one to a, up to three milligrams per kilogram, which is a big dose if you. Translate that into humans, that would not be well tolerated. Um, so that robustly and dose dependently inhibited food intake in these rats over a 12 hour period. Okay, so uh, they said during the 12 hour observation period, so they called the placebo, they call it vehicle treated. So the, they injected the tesofensine, so, you know, and it has a carrier. I'm not sure what it was. Uh, probably some sort of, you know, either saline or, um, you know, some sort of carrier oil. So they, they call the placebo vehicle. So they just injected the vehicle, whether it was saline or uh, a carrier oil with no active ingredient. So that's why they called it vehicle, just to clear that up, because I thought that that was a little strange. Um, so the placebo mice, on average, would uh, consume 54.1 uh, kilocalories over this 12 hour period, just on average. Um, the ones that got the highest dose of tesofensine, their total caloric intake dropped to 12.6 kilocalories, which was, a, they said, a 77% reduction in energy, energy intake. So these high-dose tesofensine mice, they just stopped eating. And that's what you can see here with this, this graph, which really kind of spells it all out. So we're looking at time zero here, where they're dosed with the tesofensine, and then we go out to, to a total of 12 hours. And as you can see here, like the higher the dose, the less cumulative food intake that these mice have over that 12 hours it's you know and again the the high dose the, the three milligrams per kilogram it just shuts it down completely uh they hardly eat ate at all and um it's a very profound effect on on feeding behavior in these mice okay this is another graph um also very interesting uh again looking at um you know the first of all 12 hours and then what would happen after that 12 hours without a repeated dose just a single dose and so you can see um you know the white bar is the placebo the black bar is the tesofensine and they just looked at 1.5 megs per kg in um in this particular bar graph but 
the, the graphs look basically the same with the other doses as well. So before time zero, you can see there, the white and the black bars are pretty much, they're pretty even, right? They, they, they match up pretty darn well. But in this first 12 hours, so zero to 12, kind of, you know, agreeing with that previous graph, the white bar is right up there still. And look at this, this black bar is like way down, way, way down. And then once you hit 12 hours, there's still a pretty significant difference here, but the treated mice, they're start, the treated mice are starting to eat a little bit more. It's starting to come up again, right? And then once you get into that 24 to 36 hour mark, um, they, and then beyond, obviously, they went out to 72 hours, they, they pretty much go back to eating the same. So for that first 12 hours, there is a profound effect on these mice with tesofensine. And then as time goes forward, it kind of, you, you know, the drug wears off essentially and they start eating normally again. And that's why I say, you know, maybe, again, there's no studies on this in humans, but, um, you know, if, if you know you're going to be in a situation where you're going to be tempted to overeat, like I did on my recent vacation to Dubai, <laughs> um, you know, you potentially could strategically dose tesofensine before you get into that situation to perhaps not go completely off the rails like I did with the birthday cake that I ate um, a few days ago, and I'm still feeling the effects of that. So again, no human studies on that, uh, but I just bring it up as a possibility. If any of you guys use it that way, let me know. The other interesting thing is, um, I was wondering, you know, would you have a rebound effect? So you, you know, you crushed appetite now for 12 plus hours, and then are you going to start eating more to compensate for that? And it looks like going out to the 72 hour mark, again, the, the bars are roughly the same. So you don't have like this rebound hyperphagia where you, you overeat to make up for the lost calories that you didn't eat, you know, in, during that treatment window of roughly 12 hours. So, so that's a good thing. Um, it's very, very interesting. And then these, uh, these charts here, I want to go over these just, just briefly because they, they say a lot about the way that this drug affects feeding behavior in mice. And it, and you know, this, this is probably, you can probably expect similar results in humans. So, um, look at, so we'll go, on the, we'll just start it. Like we'll go clockwise, I guess. So number of meals up here in the left corner, a, so you know, at above, once you got above one milligram per kilogram, so the number of meals that these mice ate started to go down. It wasn't, it wasn't too much different at a lower dose than that. So they were still eating the same number of meals for the most part, except at the higher dose. Um, but when you go over here to the average meal size, it starts immediately going down and just goes down and down and down as the dose goes up. So they're going, you know, they're going to the little food bowl and they're getting their little rat chow, but uh, the higher the dose of the tesofensine, they would only eat a little bit and then they would stop, okay? Um, average meal duration, same thing for the most part uh, with escalating doses of tesofensine. Um, the, uh, the amount of time that they spent at the feeding bowl would go down, which is what you'd expect. And then um, the other one that's interesting here is late latency of first meal. So that's like they wake up from sleep you're like, how long does it take them to go, oh, I'm hungry and go to the to the chow bowl? Well, you know, again, at the lower doses here, it wasn't terribly different than placebo. But as you got above uh, above 1.0 mg per kg, it took quite a long time for them to to realize maybe I'm a little bit hungry. Maybe I should go get a little snack and then go, you know, run on my little hamster wheel and do whatever it is that rats do um, when they're hanging out in their cages, uh, being subjected to uh, research studies. So, um, yeah, they, they sounds like, you know, these rats were not terribly hungry when they woke up first thing in the morning. And I'll tell you, that's an issue for me. It may be for you guys, too. That's I am starving when I wake up in the morning and it's I have a routine to mitigate that so I don't, you know, go too crazy. But um, it sounds like tesofensine really had a pretty significant effect in the mice. Um, and again, uh, we look at meal size, especially that first meal size, which, you know, again, that tends to be big for some of us. Uh, I'm, I'm guilty of that. Again, with, uh, with the exception of the 0.5 milligram dose here, which seems to be a bit of an outlier, as the dose goes up, that first, you know, breakfast meal, we'll call it, of rat chow was uh, substantially smaller 
in the in the treated group so you know you eat less often and you eat less you spend less time eating um, all of that results in a uh, overall a significant decrease in the total amount of calories consumed while the drug is in effect essentially so very interesting stuff um, the other thing they mentioned you know that in the title they mention uh, about alpha-1 blockade and I'm not going to get too deep into the, you know, alpha and beta receptors, but, um, you know, it raises the possibility that, you know, what if you're on a, what if you're on a medication that is an alpha blocker? Well, if, if we need to use the alpha one receptor in order for tesofensine to work, you know, there are a, a bunch of different drugs that get commonly used, uh, especially in men that inhibit or block the alpha-1 uh, receptor that might interfere with the effects of tesofensine. And they actually found that in mice. So they use prazosin, which get, doesn't get used very much anymore. Um, you know, it gets used for, um, you know, it can be for hypertension and prostate issues, but um, I don't know if I've ever prescribed prazosin. I mean, maybe I did in residency like 20 years ago. It's, um, the brand name is Minipress. So it's pretty old school. I don't think anybody really uses it anymore. But if you give these mat these rats mini mini press, it blocks the effect of hydrin, and that's what this chart shows here. So um, yeah, prazosin plus placebo, it's the same as uh, placebo. Prazosin plus tesofensine, also pretty close to placebo. So the prazosin blocked the effect of uh, of the um, of the tesofensine. So why is that relevant? Well, you know, you guys, you know, you may not be on Minipress or Prazosin, but you might be on Flomax, okay, for your prostate. And, you know, that that's slightly different. It affects the alpha-1A receptor. But again, I couldn't find any data. You know, n nobody's studying uh, tesofensine and Flomax at this point. So keep in mind that if you don't get an effect from tesofensine, and you just happen to be on Flomax, you know, you could be, these two drugs could be canceling each other out to a certain extent, um, or at least the Flomax is canceling out the tesofensine and you're not getting the effect there. Uh, terazosin, otherwise known as Hytrin, uh, used to prescribe a lot of that actually for prostate issues, BPH specifically, uh, way back in the day. It, it still does get prescribed. I still see it um, every now and then. And uh, but Flomax, you know, and some of the other derivatives of, of Flomax, some of the newer versions um, tend to work a lot better. And so you just don't see as much hydrin anymore, but it's it's totally still out there. So if you're on that medication, it, uh, it totally could be an issue. OK. OK, let's look at um, another human study here. So we talked about the rats. Um, and again, th there, there are tons of studies on on tesofensine. They're all small. So they're all these like phase one and two, and then in one case, phase three clinical trials. They're all small. Uh, and this one is too, it's randomized control trial of, of Tesomet for weight loss in hypothalamic obesity. So um, Tesomet is a combination. They, they added metoprolol into this. And I'll talk about in a second why they add, like why would you add a beta blocker to tesofensine? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second, but that's what they did in this particular uh, group of patients. So, um, and this is a particular, a unique group of patients with something called hypothalamic obesity, which is a very unfortunate condition where, you know, usually through trauma or, you know, some secondary or acquired reason, uh, people have damage to their hypothalamus. Um, and so they lose the ability to control their eating because all of those, you know, those important parts of the brain that regulate satiety, food cravings, et cetera, have been now been damaged. So a lot of times, like, you know, you'll see this in uh, people who've had brain tumors or who have had radiation or some other trauma to the brain, perhaps a stroke. There are some congenital and genetic uh, causes of this as well, but it's super difficult to treat. Like they, they don't respond to behavioral and lifestyle stuff. They have a structural brain problem. Um, but tesofensine, it turns out, actually works, you know, reasonably well for them. Uh, so this, this, you know, maybe it'll get approval for this particular group of people, and that will be the way that it gets to the market. I don't know. But uh, anyway, in this particular group, again, a small study, 21 adults with hypothalamic obesity, and they looked at them for uh, a total of uh, 24 weeks. And the dose, uh, the tesofensine dose was 0 0.5 milligrams, which is probably the most common and probably the 
best dose for this. We don't know for sure. Um, some people say that 0.25 works well for them. And some people I'll go all the way up to a milligram a day. Uh, you will hear more anecdotal reports of more serious side effects at that one milligram dose, but you know, 0.5 milligrams or 500 micrograms is uh, probably going to be the sweet spot for most people. I guess time will tell. And then that was combined with uh, 50 milligrams of metoprolol, uh, which is, you know, fairly solid dose. You know, metoprolol is typically started at 25 to 50 milligrams and um, it's typically dosed twice a day. So this was not an extended release metoprolol dose, uh, but for whatever reason, they just, they chose 50 milligrams of the, the standard metoprolol. And, Again, interesting why they chose this. Um, they they did this because one of the side effects, and we'll talk about side effects here shortly, is that there there seems to be a um, a, stati a statistically significant elevation in patients' heart rate um, on tesofensine, which isn't surprising. Like right? if you know if cocaine raises your heart rate, so does uh, tesofensine, although not as much as cocaine, thank God. Um, so the idea is, well, we can we can combine this with a beta blocker. And then, you know, maybe we can we can blunt some of this tachycardia that uh, patients are experiencing. And, you know, it could be unpleasant for people that, you know, are prone to, you know, feeling palpitations and whatnot, or maybe who have cardiac dysrhythmias, uh, et cetera. They probably shouldn't be taking test fencing. But regardless, I think that's um, that's the rationale for that. It's interesting that they chose metoprolol. Um, you know, beta blockers are not ideal drugs to put on to give to people who are interested in losing weight with a few exceptions um you know metoprolol in particular some of these older uh generation more cardio selective uh beta blockers they are in many cases associated with weight gain there was a gemini trial which did show metabolic slowdown and some weight gain in patients. So it's always a risk benefit analysis. Um, there can be some, you know, minor perturbations in people's lipids and glucose metabolism, which are unfavorable with metoprolol and, and, and drugs like that. It, it would have been a much better choice to use like a third generation beta blocker, something like nabivolol or carvedilol, which really doesn't have those effects to the same extent and would be a little bit more weight friendly. So look for a big pharma maybe to come out with a carvedilol or nabivolol uh, and tesofensine combo uh, combo drug at some point, maybe when this thing gets finally approved. Um, but anyway, I digress. That's I think that's the reason why they, they, they did the metoprolol. So um, in terms of side effects, before we get to the, 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 the actual data, um, again, pretty well tolerated here. There was, uh, there was a patient that dropped out because it precipitated, they, they had an anxiety disorder to begin with and apparently made it quite a bit worse. And so this particular patient dropped out of the study. Um, the other things were, uh, they considered them relatively mild. So sleep disturbances, 50% of them had a sleep disturbance. But again, it's hard to make, you know, when you have 20 something patients, you know, when you say half of them had a sleep disturbance, well, what would that look like if we had, you know, 20,000 patients? I don't know. But uh, anyway, for what it's worth, it, sleep disturbances were present in half of them. 13% had um, in the placebo group had a sleep disturbance. Dry mouth, which isn't too surprising, was um, dry mouth was 43%, uh, 0% in the placebo group. So it's probably a real thing. Headache, 36% in the treatment group, 0% in placebo. And in, in this particular case, not surprisingly, there was no significant difference in heart rate or blood pressure because, of course, the metoprolol probably took care of that. The, the studies out there, by the way, I don't mean to skip ahead in terms of side effects, but, you know, some of them do show a, a some, some minor elevations in blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, but there's a few others that don't. So it's not a consistent finding, but um, the, the elevated heart rate does seem to be a real and consistent uh, finding in, in most of the studies that I was able to pull. Okay. So these are some charts, you know, how well did this stuff work in this, you know, relatively small group of adults with uh, hypothalamic obesity? Turns out it worked pretty well. So this is uh, the first one here that's labeled figure three, changes in body weight over time. So the top one is obviously placebo. And by the way, like they all received like diet and exercise, you know, counseling and, you know, what that entailed who knows but uh you know the placebo group did lose a little bit of weight initially but then as often happens you know um they started regaining their weight and at the end of the, of the uh 24 weeks were basically back where they started but not so with the tesofensine group they just continued to lose 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 and at 24 weeks they had lost um 
this is a this is in percent so 6.6 percent of their original body weight which is pretty impressive um you know the interesting thing is you know at 24 weeks the trajectory still continues down so it'd be really interesting to see you know if this goes out 48 weeks you know or longer is that you know when do we hit that plateau i don't know I don't know. That's hopefully we'll get some studies eventually on that, but it didn't seem to plateau very much, uh, if at all, um, over the course of the 24 weeks. Um, so, so that was body weight. And then here's this next chart here, looking at uh, satiety scores. So they would measure, you know, how full do you feel at uh, with you know after a meal, etc. And you know, surprisingly, not surprisingly, the uh, these poor people with their damaged hypothalamus, they they you know, on the placebo group did not feel full at all. They were probably hungry all the time, but there was a, a very significant improvement in um, the, the Tesla group. So the Tesla fencing group um, felt, uh, you know, much more satisfied with their meals. I, I wish they had measured, you know, how big their meals were and whatnot, like, like they did with the rats. But my feeling is that, you know, generally if you reach a high level of satiety, during a meal, what do you do? You, you stop eating, right? You push away, so you eat less, and you probably eat less frequently as well. So I think that rat study likely does translate over, but just just goes to show you that uh, you know we're not just talking about losing weight here, but we're um, we're addressing like one of the major, if not the major, issues that causes people to fall off the wagon here, which is hunger, and in many cases, you know, cravings, which tests. Um, Tesofensine also helps with food cravings. So um, it's, uh, you know, in many ways, at least on paper, this sounds like the ideal drug. And, you know, unfortunately, there's no such thing as an ideal drug. Um, but things are looking, you know, looking fairly promising for this. So overall, the, the placebo group lost 0.4 kilograms. So essentially no weight loss in the placebo group, which is exactly what you would expect. And the Tesla fencing group, they lost 6.9 kilos over uh, 24 weeks, which again was 6.6% of their um, of their starting weight. So, you know, not as high as uh, terzepatide, for example, but certainly approaching, you know, GLP-1 agonist level of, um, of, uh, of efficacy. So, you know, again, I, I don't know. Let's assume that this drug comes to market. Um, I, I don't know how much it's going to cost. It will certainly be expensive at first uh, when it comes out as a brand name. But, um, you know, I have a feeling it's probably because it's an oral agent, you know, if for no other reason than it's an oral agent, will likely be a whole lot less expensive than um, Manjaro, Azembic, you know, et cetera which, you know, are extremely expensive, um, especially since now the FDA is clamping down on compounded versions of it. And, you know, the the only versions available, at least in the U.S., to to patients with obesity are going to be the big pharma brand name ones. And um, as we know, insurance companies do not like to pay for stuff like that. Um, so this could potentially be, you know, a good alternative. So, okay, let's talk about side effects real quick. You know, I mentioned the heart rate issue Five to 10 beats per minute is what most of the studies show. That is uh, obviously blunted by concomitant use of a beta blocker. Again, if, you know, if at all possible, you know, you'd probably want to steer towards some of the, one of the newer beta blockers, Carvedilol and the Bivolol would probably be a better choice, um, being that they're a little bit more weight neutral. Um, and if, you know, especially if you're taking this for, uh, for weight loss, which is obviously what it's intended for. The blood pressure studies, you know, most of them that I saw did have a little bit of a, I mean, we're talking like less than five points systolic, diastolic uh, elevation in blood pressure, but a lot of them showed no change in blood pressure. And it, it may be that, you know, the Tesla fencing does elevate blood pressure on its own, but at the same time, you know, people are losing tons of body weight, which clearly is associated with lowering of blood pressure. So it may be that those two effects like offset each other um, a little bit. So. One of the things I'm concerned about with tesafensine, and again, I, again, it's, the studies are small, and I'm not seeing there's not a huge signal for this, but um, there's there's potential just based on its mechanism. You know, when when you are increasing the levels of these neurotransmitters, especially all three of them at the same time, you know, in susceptible individuals, it raises the possibility of like precipitating like some neuropsychiatric issues. 
um, agitation, panic attacks, mood disorders, um, you know, mania, you know, I've, I don't know if it would precipitate something as severe as like a schizophrenic or psychotic episode, but that certainly is a possibility. The, the thing that you should be aware of is in these studies, I mean, they screened out people for the most part with serious mental health disorders in these, you know, phase one through three trials. So we don't really know, like if this is released out to the general public, which it kind of is already, um, you know, are we going to start seeing, you know, an uptick in that? Um, so again, if any of you out there are using this stuff and you've had issues with uh, panic attacks or anxiety or any kind of like neuropsychiatric problems, please let me know in the comments because I'm, I'm super curious about that. But, you know, that, that was like one of the first things when I saw how this, you know, the mechanism of this drug, I'm like, this could, you know, in, in certain susceptible individuals, like this could be, you know, potentially a serious problem. And um, I guess time will tell. So um, I mentioned the, the cousin of tesofensine, uh, uh, nomofensine. So nomofensine works in a very similar fashion. It's obviously a just slightly different molecule, but uh, it came out in the 70s as an antidepressant. It didn't really work that well, but it was pulled from the market like in the mid 80s because uh, it caused hemolysis through a mechanism I'm not, I don't truly understand. Uh, hemolysis is like bursting of your red blood cells. So not, not a good thing. So I don't know if it was an autoimmune thing, it was a direct, you know, toxic effect of the drug. So that thing got yanked. Um, there has been, at least in the limited studies that we have, no evidence that tesofensine is associated with hemolysis whatsoever. Uh, but again, you know, we have bigger studies, maybe, maybe that could be an issue. Um, something to be be uh, aware aware of i mentioned the insomnia issue the dry mouth that seems to be a real thing uh, a lot of patients experience nausea in these studies the the sleep disturbance makes a lot of sense so i mean it, it's tough with the, the long half-life i mean it's not like you can just take this stuff in the morning and then it's kind of gone in in the evening it's still going to be there in the evening and uh you know it could be you know could be a problem if especially if you already have issues with sleep you know as it is so just you know just stuff to be aware of now the other thing that really concerns me that i haven't seen anybody talk about in any of these other um, youtube videos that are out there is is the you know the strong potential for like drug drug interactions and you know a lot of people are on ssris a lot of people are on multiple antidepressants these days like large percentage of our population which already affect neurotransmitter levels, among other things. And so, you know, there's a potential you're adding in tesofensine in there. Um, or, you know, are we going to start having, you know, issues with um, something like serotonin syndrome, which I've seen a lot in the emergency room, you know, in my career, or potentially, God forbid, something called neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which you can look up. It's a often fatal condition. I've seen it twice and it was super severe. Uh, both patients nearly died um and you know required intubation and uh, you know aggressive cooling measures and and those were precipitated by uh misadventures i'll call it with antidepressants so these things are not to be taken lightly um you know i would be extremely cautious if i was on an anti antidepressant of any kind and, and with tesofensine i personally my advice would be just to avoid it entirely unless you get a complete green light from your doctor which you know, the, the odds are your, your primary care doctor or your, even your psychiatrist may never have even heard of tesofensine. So uh, I doubt you'll get the green light. But I, I think the risk would be too high. I wouldn't I wouldn't mess with that. Um, so, you know, the other thing to think about anytime you take a drug, you know, it has to be metabolized or it has to be excreted. And a lot of times that gets done in the liver. There's a cytochrome P450 system there. Um, tesofensine is metabolized by the CYP3A4 enzyme system, which is the most prevalent one, um, like up to 50% of the drugs that are out there on the market, both over the counter and prescription are metabolized in to some extent by this particular enzyme system. So it's, and, and again, in and of itself, if you don't overload that system, it works just fine. You can, you know, you can take drugs that, that tax that system to a certain extent, but you can run into issues when you start taking multiple drugs that now are both competing for that enzyme. And so 
a lot of times what will happen is now one of those drugs or both, for example, are not being broken down as quickly as they should be and you'll get elevated levels. And again, I see stuff like this in the emergency room all the time where, um, you know, a patient is, who is on a, on a drug and, you know, their primary care physician or somebody else uh, puts them on another drug, uh, not knowing that they are also metabolized through the same enzyme process. And then now we end up, you know, with, you know, serious toxicity from, from, one, from that second drug or maybe the first one. So there's a huge long list that... <clears throat> The really strong inhibitors of this uh, CYP3A4, so in terms of antibiotics, clarithromycin, which doesn't get used that much anymore, brand name I believe is Biaxin, used to be big with sinusitis and otitis and upper respiratory stuff, but a lot of problems with clarithromycin, prolonged QT syndrome, stuff like that, so I don't think I've prescribed that in about 15 years. Um, uh, itraconazole, ketoconazole, now that does, like those are antifungals which have a lot of liver toxicity, very hard on the liver. And then there's a whole host of like uh, HIV drugs. So if you have HIV and you're on uh, triple therapy, um, you probably should avoid tesofensine. It's probably a good idea. But all kinds of other drugs, uh, calcium channel blockers, uh, especially like diltiazem, verapamil, you don't want to get toxic on those. <laughs> Trust me, uh, that that's a serious serious problem. Uh, Antiarrhythmic drugs like amiodarone are metabolized there. So, again, adding in tesofensine, it just adds more work to that enzyme system, and then you can end up with toxicity. So, um, anyway, the the list is super long. It's just something that, that you guys should be aware of. Again, I haven't heard anybody talk about it on YouTube, so I'm just going to throw it out there. And then the other thing to to keep in mind, like we're all genetically different, right? So. Um, you know, one to two percent of the world's population, and it does vary by ethnic group, will have some sort of a loss of function mutation in this CYP3A4 uh, enzyme system where, you know, you, you have it there, it works, it just doesn't work that well or doesn't work as well as the, quote, wild type. So if you're unfortunate to have one of those, then, you know, you have to be extra careful with what you put in your body in terms of prescription drugs. Of course, it's not even it's not just prescription drugs, though, it's supplements, too. So, um you know, I would be very cautious about like St. John's wort. Um, oh, what's the other one? So uh, uh, rhodiola, which, you know, is popular in the naturopathic world, is an MAOI. It's an MAOI. Um, I always say MAOI inhibitor, but the I means inhibitor. So, um, you know, that could be seriously problematic. You start taking a lot of rhodiola with your tesofensine, and now, now you've got toxicity from that. So uh, I just would be extremely cautious with this particular drug and um and just in general like polypharmacy is generally a bad idea you know there, there are times when polypharmacy is indicated but you know it needs to be done under the supervision of a of a competent physician who understands pharmacology and who's intimately familiar with all of the drugs that you're taking how they work their mechanisms etc you know and unfortunately with tesofensine because you know i think I'm going to guess that 99% of you have gotten this drug um, probably off of uh, research chemical sites and are, or are basically just managing it on your own. You know, no offense, but you probably don't have that kind of a pharmacology background to do this in a safe manner. So, again, if, if you're going to use tesofensine, I think um, it needs to be done under a physician's, a competent physician's uh, supervision so you don't get yourself in trouble. Okay. So um, other precautions, um, and we'll just, we'll end with that. Um, again, you know, most of the tesofensine that's out on the market, my impression is that it comes from these research chemical sites. So, and I've mentioned this multiple times in other talks, you know, when I've mentioned SARMs and peptides and things like that is, you know, it's buyer beware, right? Like you have no idea what's in that bottle. The, the quality control is uh is highly suspect in my opinion and i know that a lot of them you know they say that they provide a you know an independent third party testing sheet that shows the purity okay great you know maybe that's true but you know i could photoshop one of those you know in about five minutes and i'm not very good with photoshop okay um so just consider the source be careful guys um you know, hate to see anything bad happen to you. Uh, again, I mentioned this before, but if you're on any other, if you're on an, an antidepressant of any kind, if you're on a mood stabilizer of any kind, um, 
especially you know if you have bipolar i'd be concerned about you know precipitating a manic episode if uh you know if you took too much uh or even any tesofensine um you know anything that messes with dopamine serotonin and norepinephrine and this includes some of these uh over-the-counter nootropic supplements i think you just need to be very very cautious you need to work with a doctor who understands this stuff um uh or you know ask questions of a you know pharmacists are pretty well versed in this stuff as well uh, many of them are. So you might be able to, if your doctor doesn't know, you can potentially get a hold of a pharmacist and ask them. And then finally, you know, just like with any drug, if you are going to use this, uh, I would use the lowest effective dose. Um, and I would use it for the shortest duration of time, like to achieve a certain goal. It's probably not a good idea to be on tesofensine for years and years and years. We just don't know. We don't have any data. You know, there's no safety data going out past a year that I'm aware of. So just you know, again, just be cautious. And then the final, the final recommendation I'll have with this is the same recommendation I give to people who use these GLP-1 agonists. You know, both of these drugs, uh, drug, you know, drug classes, they they work by causing you to eat less. You know, the mechanisms are different, but at the end of the day, you're eating less. So yeah, you're losing weight, but again, you want to make sure that you're not losing precious muscle tissue. So you did, you need to not, you need to have a plan. You need to have a plan, so you need to make sure that you're eating an adequate amount of protein, which at a minimum is going to be 2.2 grams per kilo. And if you're in a serious calorie deficit, which you probably will be on this drug, it's probably going to be more than that, at least based on the current literature. You absolutely need to be incorporating resistance training. That's the, one of the best things you can do to hold on to muscle tissue. Eating adequate amounts of protein is, is nice, but if you're not also engaged in resistance training, you are going to lose more muscle, muscle tissue. So just make sure that you do that. Don't just take this stuff and go about your business and you know, every day when you step on the scale, get get happy because what's again at the end of the day, maybe you lose thirty pounds. Well, if ten of that is muscle tissue, now you've you've wrecked your metabolic rate. And guess what? That weight's coming back. That's coming back. And then you're gonna be like, Oh, I gotta get back on tesofensine or GLP one agonist of your choice, whatever the case is. And it's just becomes this roller coaster and you know, that's obviously not not healthy, it's not good for you long term. So um, make sure you you have a plan. If um, and if you need help with that, reach out to a physician or a nutritionist or somebody uh, or even a trainer who's well versed in this sort of stuff and can help you do this uh, in a safe manner. So that's all I got on tesofensine, guys. Super interesting compound. Um, I, I'm expecting this to get FDA approval. I don't know what's taken so long. I guess we'll see. Um, I would love to hear your guys' stories. I have no personal experience with tesofensine. I have no reason to take tesofensine. I'm not terribly interested in it. Um, but, you know, as a doctor that treats obesity, I I want as many arrows in my quiver as I can. And so if this ends up being a viable drug that I can use in addition to what else is out there, then I would love to have it. But it, clearly I want it to be safe. Um, and I think that we need a lot more studies to, to help iron that out a little bit. So, all right, guys, take care. I will catch you next time. All Man Medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind, including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here, and if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.